في ندخل هذا كمان يعني يمكن ما Okay, everybody with us tonight. Okay. Yes, Dr. Firas. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you to each and every one of you for being with us in this educational evening. Uh, this is a continu continuation of our Royal Medical Services uh, Orthopedic Department uh, educational program. I think uh, today we'll start the pediatric orthopedic uh, uh, subspecialty uh, module. Uh, and uh, uh, I think we uh, uh, have uh, Dr. Mata Samidhoun with us tonight uh, to discuss DDH. As you all know, Dr. Mata Sam is one of the best uh, fellows in pediatric uh, orthopedic specialty. And we all know him uh, in his hard working, he's a hard worker. And he uh, working with us in research, and uh, uh, he is uh, committed uh, to uh, to our uh, uh, pediatric division. And uh, I myself choose him to be one of our team. Uh, to to this evening, we are uh, pleased to be able to welcome Mr. Uh, Barry Matthew from UK. Uh, Mr. Barry is a consultant pediatric orthopedic surgeon working at University Hospital Southampton. Uh, NHS UK. Uh, he is interested in uh, deformity correction and lengthening. Uh, so welcome, uh, Matthew, to this uh, evening. Uh, as you know, these lectures are oriented to residents. Uh, the program is oriented to residents. And uh, we are happy to join us in this uh, evening. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Barry, if you want to give a few words, please. Well, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? Yes, we can, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, good, yeah. good. Well, thank you, uh, Mutazem, for inviting me and uh, greetings from a, uh, a cold uh, United Kingdom. It's, sort of, it's not quite snowing outside where I'm now in Southampton, but in other parts of the country, it's, it's uh, heavy snowfall. And obviously, if there's any snow at all, in this country, the whole place comes to a complete stop. Uh, you know, the traffic is, it's all disaster. It is, it is, but um, uh, anyway, thank you very much. And we're very much looking forward to uh, Murtazem coming to uh, work with us uh, in Southampton uh, uh, later on in the year. Um, 
and uh, I've only been at Southampton for just over three years now. Uh, previously, I worked for um, I worked in London uh, for about 19 years as a consultant, and there I was doing some adult trauma and adult uh, limb reconstruction as well as uh, pediatric orthopedics. It was about 50-50 split, but now in Southampton, I'm just full-time children's orthopedics, and there are eight of us in children's orthopedics, and we're separate from the adult orthopedic service, and there are about, um, about 20 adult orthopedic surgeons. We don't really have much to do with them. They're a separate department, separate uh, division, uh, but in children's orthopedics, there's eight of us. So thank you very much for the invitation. You are most welcome. Thank you, Mr. Barry. We are happy to have you with us in this lecture. Uh, as all know, in, in our pediatric division in King Kusai Medical Center, we cover uh, uh, mainly pediatric uh, uh, problems from congenital deformities in the lower limb and uh, upper limb. We do brachial plexus and uh, a lot of uh, limb, uh, lower limb correction using a lot of devices like TSF and uh, 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 as well. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, you will find uh, when you host uh, uh, Dr. Mata Samidhoun, you will find him uh, oriented to most of uh, the cases in pediatrics. Uh, and uh, uh, I think we'll give the mic to Dr. Mata Sam to start his lecture. Great. Okay, thank you, Dr. Feras and uh... A warm welcome to Dr. Matthew. <clears throat> we hope you to, to enjoy this uh, evening. And also I have, uh, would like to introduce uh, Dr. Malik Gnemat, who is the chief of orthopedic department at Real Medical Services. Dr. Malik. Yeah, Dr. good Malik. evening, everyone. Good evening, Dr. Matthew. So good evening. Dr. Yeah. Malik Gnemat is the chief of orthopedic uh, department uh, of uh, and real medical services. Yes, yes, Dr. Malik. <clears throat> yeah, good evening, everyone. Good evening, Dr. Matthew. Happy to have you in this, our CME program. As Firas said, it's for residency. Luckily, we have the, today the chapter of pediatric orthopedic surgery. I've heard from Watson that he's going oh, to have... I've heard oh, will be with his fellowship. I'm sure who will get a great experience with yeah. your excellency. Yeah. Open to you yeah. oh, in Jordan yeah. and after yeah. we finish. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Try to share. Yeah. Again, oh. Nice to have you yeah. in this. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Malik. Now we will start uh, our lecture. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, to. Master, it is it is fine. The slides, yes. Yes, yes, it's fine, sir. Let us mm -hmm. give, the, give an introduction about our uh, department. We are working at Queen Rania Hospital for Children, which is uh, the largest uh, hospital dedicated in Jordan, dedicated only for treatment of uh, of, of children, and uh, in <clears throat> and this uh, pediatric in, uh, orthopedic department, we are running two clinics per week and uh, five theaters. And also we have done uh, more than 400 uh, cases, uh, minor procedures over the last year, as well as uh, more than 700. If you please, sir, I am going to mute all participants in order just to open your mic when I do the mute, please. Okay. More than 700. Uh, Nasser, please unmute Martasam. He is unmute. So we are very busy hospital. We are the, the we are we receiving cases from all around the country as well as from outside, from uh, Gulf area, from Iraq, from Yemen, Libya, from everywhere. We are receiving cases of uh, complex cases in pediatric uh, orthopedic uh, surgery. And regarding our team, we are lead, our lead, Dr. Firas Ibrahim, who is uh, who, uh, make this introduction, and, as well as Dr. Ahmed El Marzouk, 
and Razi Atarawne and Haider Saudi, me, myself, Matasim Lidhoun, as well as Ashraf Lutum, who is currently in UK, making his fellowship, and Iyas Isgali and Ria Rajdan. We are eight surgeons working together under the lead, uh, Mr. Firas Ibrahim. We are doing great job. We are all, all, almost always very busy with making uh, in the operations and the, and the clinic as well. So let us start with DDH. Uh, now we can, uh, the DDH basically can be defined as abnormal hip uh, development. You know that uh, uh, DDH is very common and you can find that uh, one, one uh, there is a one uh, patient in out of 1000 has a frank dislocation. And also we can find that one, one out of 100 people has a dysplasia. And this differs from uh, depending on the ethnic group. In some ethnic groups like Native Americans, you can find one frank dislocation out, uh, out or maybe uh, 188 frank dislocation in 1000, which means that there is significant difference between ethnic groups. And it's a, a very common disease. We see them uh, very commonly in the clinic. And most of the surgeries we have done are related to DDH. There is a high number of surgeries we do related to DDH from OB reduction, pelvic osteotomies, from the complications of DDH. So it is a very common disease. And uh, the, regarding the battle physiology, I think it is the initial uh, thing is the instability that causes the dysplasia. So the first thing is dysplasia. This dysplasia will progress for subluxation and then for frank dislocation. Once the hip is dislocated, this will make a secondary barriers for reduction, which means a chronic dislocation. And I will mention this later on in this presentation. And after that, when there is a chronic dislocation, there will be anatomical changes for a stabulum and for, for the femoral hip. We will see a deficiency in the anterior lateral part of the stabulum. We will see antiversion of the femoral neck and antiversion of the stabulum as well. So the, the bad physiology starts with dysplasia to subluxation to frank dislocation. And if you go, if you uh, go deep in the, what is the, what are the obstacles for the reduction? There is two categories of obstacles. There is extra articular obstacles like iliopsoas tendon and adductors, and there is intraarticular obstacles like transverse acetabular ligament or bulbinar or ligament anterior. And these obstacles, sometimes we need to address them to make the reduction. And this can be illustrated more on the end of this presentation by on the on on the surgical part. But I think we have to know this fact that at the beginning, there is the, the, the DTH is a spectrum of disease. So I start with a dysplasia. Almost this dysplasia means shallow acetabulum. And after dysplasia, this will progress to subluxation. And after that, to frank dislocation. So it is a, it is a spectrum of disease. And for the assessment, Every newborn should be assessed for by clinical examination for DDH. And this examination does not mean screening for, for all with an ultrasound or x-ray. I mean by a, a, a newborn assessment for by just by clinical examination if there is signs of a, a, a DDH. But also you have to take the history, which means is a under the trivial assessment of the if we go to the triple assessment to ass by history, by ultrasound, and by examination, this triple assessment will, will, will identify the patients with DDH. But to be honest, the, the screening for DDH <clears throat> is not a universally adopted, which means that you cannot make a screening program for all babies to rule out DDH you have to identify those babies with risk factors. These risk factors, if available in the, this patient, we can send him for ultrasound to, to, to rule out DDH. So some countries nowadays adopted a screening program, for example, ultrasound at six weeks for all babies. Some countries 
ultrasound at six weeks for risk for those children with risk factors. It is not universally agreed. There is a too much controversy regarding the screening program. But I think the most important point that you have to use your history, examination, and ultrasound. There is no rigid rule that you can make ultrasound at six weeks, X-ray at three months. Whatever the rule you have to learn is not true. I think the most important one that you have to keep in mind the triple assessment, history, examination, and radiology. By history, you can identify the risk factors for DDH. What we mean by risk factors? The most important one is the positive family history. And this is a major risk factor. The second one is the breach presentation. For example, if you know that this patient has a family history and has a breach, this is high risk for DDH. I can screen for him. I can send him for ultrasound at six weeks. But if the, if, if, if the patient, there is a minor risk factors like first baby or females or oligohydraminous and torticollis, prematurity, these risk factors are minors. And there is too much controversy about to send them for ultrasound or not. But this is not only the only part of the triple assessment. As we said, you have to take history. You have to examine the baby. If there is a risk factor, in addition to abnormal findings on a clinical examination, I think you have to send him for ultrasound. But if there is no risk factor, no abnormal signs, I think it is not advised to send him for ultrasound at six weeks. So the screening is a critical part. You, you can go enjoy, in our practice for us, we take the history in addition to examination, to, to send them for, for screening or for ultrasound or for, for X-ray. And what about the clinical examination? By clinical examination, you can look for asymmetry, which means that there is abnormal to, to, uh, or there's a difference between the two sides. For example, for the gluteal folds and also for the gliase sign, which means that there is one limb is shorter than the other. And if you look from the AB view, you can see assess for shortening of the femur. While from the lateral view, you can assessment for you make assessment for short shorter tibia. So these two signs, these two signs, the gluteal folds asymmetry and Gilyazi sign, this indicate there is a dislocation of the hip. And this is abnormal finding can suggest that there is a dislocation and you can send him for ultrasound or X-ray. And another findings that limited abduction, if there is also a limited abduction on one side, there is, this means that there is maybe dislocation or subluxation. And another important clinical test is the Barlow's and also Ortolani test. These tests are done also together with the clinical examination, the triple assessment. And in this video, we will, we will see how we will make the Ortolani and Barlow test. So the first important that you have to make the baby relaxed to examine him. And he showed that by his mother or sometimes with toys around him. So the first critical point that the baby should be relaxed. Flexed position. And I start by abducting both of the hips, and I want to look for symmetric hip abduction. That's abduction of the bilateral hips. And you, you see, he make that the abduction test. There is a, should be a symmetric abduction of both hips. 
you can see on her, both of her hips abduct the same amount. And then I bring them both up together and I do the Galeazzi test. And I'm looking for knee height. And you can see how the right knee is a little bit lower than the left knee here, which suggests that this hip might be dislocated. And then again, I'll bring them. And you can see now the Galeazzi test is positive. The left side is lower than the right one, which means that the left one may be dislocated into abduction and then I'll do my Ortolani and my Barlow test so on this hip here the left hip I'm holding the knee and I'm gonna and I'm gonna examine one hip at a time and I'm gonna bring the left hip into a deduction adduction and give it some posterior stress to see if I can move it out of the hip socket and that would be a Barlow exam and that was a negative Barlow exam and then the Ortolani exam is the opposite where I abduct it and I lift up on the trochanter to see if I can put a dislocated hip back into the socket and this is a negative Ortolani exam and so now I'm going to do the same exam maneuver on the right hip where I'm going to do a Barlow test so I'm going to adduct it and there, it dislocated out the back. So that's a positive bar. So, to, just to revise, Barlow is a provocative test, which means you make a dislocation. The hip is in, and you dislocate the hip. This is the Barlow. While the Ortolani is, you reduce the hip. The hip is out, and you reduce the hip, and this is the Ortolani. So, Barlow is a provocative, you dislocate. Ortolani, you, re, you, re, you reduce the hip. And you, you hear a clunk or sometimes you feel a clunk when, when, the, when there is a reduction or dislocation. Exam. And then the Ortolani is the opposite where I lift it up and it pops back in. So positive Barlow out, positive Ortolani in. Barlow out, Ortolani in. And you can see how it's not uncomfortable for her. It doesn't cause her any pain. Okay, just to continue. So we start with, with history, the triple assessment, history. Ask for risk factors, examination for asymmetry and Barlow Ortolani. And then... You can see this baby, how, it, how she's walking. Sorry. This is the presentation when the child is walking. We are, we, you can see there is a waddling gait because there is a limb is shorter than the other. If you can concentrate on the video, you can, you can notice that she's walking on the dislocated left hip. So it's a waddling gait. So when you examine a child, if he's a small baby, you will find that Ortolani and Barlow is positive and you can find these findings. But once the, the child is growing and more than six months, sometimes these findings, you will not find them. And after walking age, you will find some such abnormal gait or limping. And now we will go to the third part of the triple assessment is the, about the X-ray and ultrasound. And all, always we, we are speaking about two lines, the Birkin line and Hilgenreiner line. Our reference line is the Hilgenreiner line, which runs through the trirradiate cartilage. It is a horizontal line. And the second one, is the Birkin line, which is perpendicular to the previous one. So we, we, we draw a two lines. The first one is the horizontal one through the triradiate cartilage. The second one is perpendicular to the first one and called the Birkin's line at the lateral edge of the acetabulum. This result in four quadrants. The femoral head, the ossific nucleus of the femoral head should lies in the inferior medial part of the of the quadrants. This is a quadrant called the inferior medial quadrant. And this head 
or, or femoral head or the ossificant nucleus normally should lies in this quadrant. Another important parameter is the acetabular index. We measure by it the acetabular development or acetabular dysplasia. The acetabular index is, is, is a drawn between the Hilgen Reiner line, which line the line between the two radiate cartilage and the roof of the acetabulum. This angle should be less than 13. 30 degrees below three months and less than 25 below six months. And another important line is the Shinton line should be continuous between the femoral neck and the, the superior, the lower part of superior pubic remory. And you can, if you can apply these parameters on this X-ray, we will start with this line. The Hilger Reiner line. Then the Perkins line. And we can see that the ossific nucleus of both hips are in. The ossific nucleus of both hips are in the inferior medial quadrant. But, and also the Shinton line is intact. There is no problem for dislocation or subluxation. But there is a problem with development of the acetabulum. The acetabulum is shallow. We, call, we refer to this. We call this shallow, this shallow of the acetabulum as acetabular dysplasia. The, the, the acetabulum is not well mature. And if you measure the angle, you find that on the right side is 24, while on the left is 33. This child has a left acetabular dysplasia. He has no dis subluxation, no dislocation. If you can find the the ossific nucleus in this quadrant, that is fine. So it is not subluxed, not dislocated. I'm trying to be simple for that. If you look at this X-ray, it is easily apparent that the right, the right hip is in its position while the left is outside the hip. And this is a frank dislocation. And this is another one, another example for, DD, for dislocation of the left hip. And also this one. And this pelvic X-ray showed the showed untreated DDH in adult patient. You can see this how it is obvious now for this he is adult now with a DDH. And now we go to the other part of uh, radiological examination about the ultrasound. The ultrasound is is the best treatment in, in children less than six months because the ossific nucleus sometimes is not apparent before six months. And it is a dynamic examination and has no radiation. When you make ultrasound, we make it on lateral position, on the lateral aspect of the, of the femoral on, or of, of the hip joint, as you can see from the image. And in this, you can see, this is the femoral head, this is the dark tissue, the black one. If you can see from this one, this image, to this representation. We have the iliac bone and two cartilage, the cartilage of acetabulum and the triradiate cartilage. And this is the capsule of the head and the three muscles of the rectus femoris, the gluteus minimus and the gluteus medius. So just to revise, we are seeing this picture from the lateral aspect. We are not making ultrasound from anterior. We are making from lateral. The first point is the, that of the greater trochanter. This is the bony landmark. The second landmark is the iliac bone, which is a, a major landmark. And two cartilage, cartilage of acetabulum and triradiate cartilage. And also there is a point, critical point is labrum. And the three muscles, that of tendon frictus femoris, gluteus minimus and gluteus medius. This image, we have, to we have to keep it in our mind. We have to revise it many times because we will depend it to, 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 to classify the case according to the graph method as we will describe later on. But there is another important point. If you can see, if you go with the probe anterior or posterior, for example, if you go anterior, you will see the pubic symphysis bone. And if you go posterior, you will see the ischial bone. 
but we don't want these bones. Our target is the triradiate cartilage. We have to see the triradiate cartilage, not the pubic bone, not the ischial bone. And this image in the coronal plan should be on the level of triradiate cartilage. Okay. After we draw these lines, uh, these images, we have to draw three points of reference. The first one is the center of the labrum. The second one is the lower limb of the iliac bone. And the third one is the bony rim of the acetabulum. This is the lateral edge of the acetabulum. These are three points of reference. We will make from these three points of reference two angles, alpha angle at B and beta angle. The, B, the reference line is from the iliac bone. And then we, we will make the point from the lower end of the, of the iliac, iliac bone. This will call the alpha angle. And from the center of the labrum, to the lateral acetabulum, this will make the beta angle. So we are talking about ultrasound. It is a lateral position, three points of reference and two angles, alpha angle, beta angle. If you look at the femoral head, if it is out, it is up, the alpha angle will be high. So our graph method for ultrasound classification. I will not go deep into the classification. I don't want you to go deep, but you have to know that there is two critical angles, the alpha angle and the beta angle. Alpha angle normally is more than 60 and beta angle less than 55. The femoral head, once it comes up, this means that alpha angle is as you see from this diagram. So now we conclude our triple assessment, history, examination, and radiology. And now what about the treatment? Our goal of treatment is to achieve and maintain a concentric reduction of the hip, as this is the primary stimulus for the, gro the growth of the acetabulum. The hip joint is a ball and socket joint. The primary stimulus for the growth of the acetabulum is a reduced hip. Once the hip is reduced, the, st the acetabulum will grow normally. If the, if the hip is outside, there will be a deficiency in the growth of the acetabulum. So our treatment goal is to achieve a concentric and a stable reduction of the hip. The treatment of DDH can be conservative and can be done by closed reduction or open reduction. If you go to conservative treatment, the first model, the first thing that we can treat by is the pavlic harness. I think this is the most common device we used in, in pediatric orthopedic is the pavlic harness. And it is an affliction, abduction, orthosis, and it is a dynamic. And always we are, we are telling the residents that you can give the abduction splint or the pavlic harness up to age of six months. Because at the age of six months, the baby start to sit. And this is a milestone in the, in the life of the baby. So there is, will be no more dy dynamic movements of the legs. We need the baby to, be, to move to his legs because once he move, he will make more abduction. So it is a dynamic device. And we have to remember the safe zone of Ramsey. I think maybe some of you hear about same Ramsey safe zone, but let me by this slide tell you what is the safe zone of Ramsey. In this diagram, if you make abduction, too much abduction, the hip will be more stable, but there is a risk of AVM. 
while if you make little abduction, there is a risk of redislocation. The safe zone is that is this green area where the hip is not at risk for avian and not at risk of redislocation. This area, if it is good wide area or large zone that is stable hip, that is good one, that is that can be continued for treatment. But if it is narrow, the green zone is narrow, this means this is, hip is unstable. And it is likely that your treatment will fail if you make it by close reduction. This is the, the Ramsey safe zone. I think it is important point, you have to know about the Ramsey safe zone. So our treatment is age-based. The first one, the first milestone is below six months. Below six months, we can apply the dynamic splint, the dynamic harness. And you can, if, if you failed, or the public harness failed, you can proceed for a closed reduction and hip spike. Below walking age, you can also up, give them abduction splint. We call it abduction splint because it is not dynamic splint. And also options of closed reduction and hip spike is available. Option of open reduction via medial approach. And at our institution, we have done hundreds of cases of medial approach. However, many centers around the world, they, are, they have too much talk about the medial approach because it has some risk of AVN and injury to medial femoral circumflex artery. And the after walking age, the best treatment is done by OB reduction via anterior approach plus minus pelvic osteotomy. So our treatment is guided by the age. Just a few words about the anterior approach. It, it's called the Smith-Peterson. You have to, to know about the anterior approach for DDH. It is the most common approach and we can do capsulography and mostly used for patients more than 12 months. In our other institutions, this is the only approach can be used for DDH. At our institution, we use this most commonly and for patients more than 12 months of, of age. The middle approach of Ladlov. We used this approach in, at, at our institution, but there is too much limited indications for it. The first one is the child should be below walking, walking age. And this has disadvantage of that higher risk of AVN and unable to perform capsulography. However, it has many advantage that has a decreased blood loss. We can do bilateral cases simultaneously and can be used in patients less than 12 months of, old, or of age. And we directly address the blocks of reduction. I think we have to know just we have two options, the anterior approach, Smith-Peterson, the middle approach of Ladlow. Another critical point added to the anterior approach is solitary osteotomy or pelvic osteotomy. If you do the surgery via middle approach, you will not, you cannot make the pelvic osteotomies or solitary osteotomy. And now just a few words about osteotomies. There is two options, the femoral osteotomy and pelvic osteotomies. When there is a dislocation, if the head is high dislocation, we call it high dislocation, Sometimes it is difficult to reduce the hip in the socket. We have to make femoral shortening just to bring the hip from outside to the, to the socket joint. And as we said from the beginning of the lecture during bathophysiology, there will be anatomical changes to the femoral head and neck. There will be severe antiversion. Sometimes we need to make varus derotation or stotomy. So sometimes you will see a valgus neck, antiverted neck, and a very high dislocation. This will be addressed by femoral osteotomies. And this one, an example for this a valgus neck, you see how we addressed by pediatric hip plate. And the pelvic osteotomies can be subdivided in two groups. 
The first one is the reconstructive, and the other one is the salvage. If you man, can achieve a concentric hip, you can go for reconstructive surgeries. But if you cannot achieve a, a stable hip or concentric hip, you go for salvage. I don't want you to go in details of these osteotomies. But for DDH, we are using the mo most commonly the redirectional osteotomies, the redirectional, which means that we redirect the acetabulum. As we said from the bath, bath of physiology, there will be anatomical changes for the acetabulum as well. So there is a deficiency in the anterior lateral part of the acetabulum. We want to redirection to make re, to redirect the acetabulum to cover the anterior lateral part of the femoral head. And so the decision is that is taken when we know the age of the patient and if the tragedy cartilage open or not and the neuromuscular condition. Just in a brief, the age of patient for, for example, for Soltar, we are talking about more than 18 months. We have done some cases below age of 18 months, like maybe 15 or 13 months. But the standard that the Soltar osteotomy should be more than 18 months and the the, 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 the below eight, age of eight years. For neuromuscular, for example, we, we, we do a Dega osteotomy. It is almost just a redirect difference because the, the, the deficiency in the acetabulum is different. In a neuromuscular patients, we are saying that the deficiency in the posterior lateral aspect, while in the DDH, the deficiency in the anterior lateral aspect. So we have to take these points in, in our mind. But I need you just to know about two osteotomies. The first one is the Salter osteotomy, and the, the second one is the treble illuminate. These are the most common osteotomies we are using for DDH. There is deficiency of the acetabulum, and we need to redirect the acetabulum to cover the femoral head. The first one is done, the Salter osteotomy. After age of seven or eight years, the symphysis pubis will not be much mobile, and you cannot hinge upon it. And you we shift our osteotomy to triple osteotomy. And in this animation, you can see how we do the solitary osteotomy. We meet, we make a complete cut through, through the iliac bone. It's just below the anterior superior iliac spine, just above the anterior inferior iliac spine. And we make a redirectional. You see, we take the stabulum to cover the deficient anterior lateral femoral head. And this is incomplete osteotomy. This is, sorry, Salter is a complete osteotomy. So we need to fix it. We take a bony graft from the iliac crest and we put two K wires. So what I need from you to know that we have to redirect the, the deficient acetabulum. And this, the redirectional can be done by Salter or treble, depending on the age. If the patient age below six or seven or eight years, we go for Salter osteotomy. It is a complete osteotomy and need to be fixed by wires. The treble innominate, it is the same almost, but with some difference that we make a three cuts rather than one cut. The first cut is through the, 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 the pubic bone. And the second cut through the ischium. Because the symphysis pubis is no more mobile. And the third cut is almost like the Salter osteotomy. And then we take all the stabulum the way to cover the femoral head. As you will see now. You see how we redirect the acetabulum. Okay. So in summary, we identified in this lecture how to 
to take a history for risk factors and the pathophysiology for DDH, and how to assess a patient with DDH, and how we manage the DDH by age. And thank you. Dr. Matasim, thank you very much. Uh, and I, I will leave the mic for uh, Dr. Ahmed Al Marzoug, who is uh, directing the educational program. Ahmed, if, if you want to uh, make comments or uh, open the floor for questions, uh, can we start by, uh, by, by Mr. Matthew, if you want to uh, make a comment, please? Well, thank you. That's a very nice talk. Um, in the UK, we, we have a similar, all babies are screened with a clinical examination and we only ultrasound selected babies. But this is something which is changing. There, there is a feeling that a clinical examination doesn't uh, you know, you, you, the, you, can, uh, you can miss some of the dislocations, particularly as the examination is done probably by one of the pediatric trainees. They might be a little bit junior and they may be relatively inexperienced. And so they may miss a dislocation. Uh, and so we're trying to work towards having a, a, a universal uh, ultrasound program, which happens in other parts of Europe. Um, but we're not quite in, there yet in the United Kingdom. So it's just a bit like in Jordan. It's just a clinical examination with risk factors and Ortolani and Barlow. And then we do an ultrasound for selected babies. I think we would also include, um, uh, I think there's some evidence that if babies do have talopes, they are a little, that is a, a minor risk factor. So I do a weekly um, Ponsetti clinic, and all those babies will will get a will get an ultrasound scan as well. Um, and then the management is the same with a Pavlik harness. We have a I don't do the hip clinics, but we'll have a very similar program. That I think that you have uh, with babies treated in Pavlik harnesses until uh, probably six months or so of age. Um, and then after that, if there's, if, if uh, we'll use casts in these older children. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dancer, do you have any, uh, any qu uh, comments from the residents or questions maybe? Uh, yes, sir. I have received uh, some questions from the residents. And we may start with a question from Dr. Lexena. Dr. Lee, um, can you hear me? Yes. Question, okay. okay, we would like to appreciate all the uh, efforts among this continuous uh, teaching process and to thank all the uh, people who are standing behind it Dr. Malik, Dr. Firas, Dr. Ahmed, and Dr. Fadi. Thank you, Dr. Matson, for this great uh, lecture. Thank you. I would just to ask uh, in a small question. As we know, the goals of the treatment of DDH are to achieve the congruency of the femoral head and the acetabulum, and to normalize the distribution of the mechanical, mechanical forces about the hip joint. In the regard of the DDH in neuromuscular patients, like CP, myelomeningeal cell patient, what's the approach of, in these patients and how to deal with them? Do we use same approach as we deal with the normal DDH patients, or there is a special consideration regarding them. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much for this good yes. question. Yes. In fact, the treatment of DDH is different than the treatment of dislocated hips in neuromuscular patients. And I think Dr. Ahmad Marzouk is with us now. Because you, Dr. Ahmad Marzouk, uh, he can uh, give us uh, some, uh, maybe uh, to clarify these points, as he is very interested in neuromuscular patients. But there is a too much difference between management of DDH, simple DDH, and management of dislocated hips in neuromuscular or syndromic cases. Dr. Ahmad Marzouk. Yes. Uh, we must make it clear that there is a difference which means when we say developmental hip dislocation, which is mainly due to 
in the sternum and capture the laxity. While in, in the neuromuscular hip dislocation, the hip dislocation is due to muscle imbalance. When we deal with a hip dislocation that is a neuromuscular, a neuromuscular problem, we divide the hip dislocation either due to paralytic conditions like myelomeningocele and or either to spastic condition like cerebral palsy. When we deal with paralytic hip dislocation, most of the time you don't need to treat because in the future it will not cause any problem to the patient. Why? Spastic hip dislocation, according to most of the studies, 50% of the patient will have osteoarthritis and painful hip in their adulthood. So we need to treat. According to the treatment in spastic hip dislocation, conservative treatment does not have a rule. You cannot treat it like in this cases by public harness or hip spike and close reduction. If the hip start to dislocate in spastic hip dislocation, surgical management must be considered. But according to the age, we divide the management from only adductor tenotomy and soft tissue release to major procedures like proximal femoral osteotomy and sternal osteotomy like DEGA or its modification like San Diego. Or if the hip is missed or destructed, maybe we need a salvage procedure like uh, exogenous arthroplasty or valgus osteotomy or other management. So, hip dislocation with a neuromuscular condition is mainly or completely different from developmental hip dislocation. Thank you. And I think I can add that uh, maybe the screening even for program or, or the screening for dislocation in CB is different. You, you can find a baby or child at three years old, uh, there is no dislocation. But after one or two years of spasticity, there will be a dislocation. There is, we always advise that we make an X-ray regular for them, X-ray at uh, six months interval or maybe one year. And there is a, a special management for them for the screening of dislocation. Or what do you think uh, you can add something, Dr. Matthew, for the management of different difference between the management between these two categories? Uh, yes, I think they are very, uh, as you said, they're completely different conditions. So. A DDH will be managing the baby in the first, you know, first few months of life. Um, whereas in cerebral palsy, um, the hips will be will be normal. I, I mean, obviously they may have DDH as well as cerebral palsy, but the dislocation in cerebral palsy will not happen until they're really much older. Uh, you know, six, seven, eight years of age, and. As uh, you said, it may be that either because of increased tone uh, or low tone, such as uh, spina bifida. Um, but it's, they're, they're very different conditions. And as you say, they do need to be, uh, the cerebral palsy hips needs to be kept under review. And, uh, and like you will typically have, uh, at least once a year, they should have a hip X-ray and we can monitor their, their um, migration uh, as, the, as the hip uh, goes sideways. You can talk about a, a migration index um, to, as, a, as a measure of how, of, 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 of the subluxation of the, of the femoral head. But it's much better to try and identify the hip early rather than waiting for it to, to dislocate. Um, so it's, it's a very different um, uh, screening program as it's a different condition. Yes, thank you. Maybe Nasser, one more question, if there is. Well, actually we have, we have two questions if we can uh, answer them. First one with uh, Dr. Omar Rigba. Dr. Omar. Yes, sir. Uh, well, I'd like to start by thanking all those who uh, made this regular online education program happen. Your efforts are uh, highly appreciated, thank you. And now since um, we all face DDH patients or uh, patients uh, or parents seeking DDH screening for their newborns at our clinics on a daily basis, and since there's no 
um, uh, let's say, clear consensus uh, in literature regarding the uh, screening programs. And because we, we have limited resources, especially in uh, peripheral hospitals, like um, uh, I, I uh, personally serve in right now, uh, because we don't have um, ultrasound available all the time. <clears throat> From your own um, experience, what's your advice regarding the best uh, screening approach uh, in terms of sensitivity, specificity, and um, maybe cost effectiveness? And um, thank you in advance. Thank you, Amar, for this uh, good question. I think we we highlighted the, the, this point during the, the, the presentation. And as you said, there is no too, too much consensus about this one. And uh, it is not only in Jordan. It is also outside. It is everywhere in the world. There is no agreement about the screening policy. Maybe Dr. Matthew, we said that in, in, in newly there is a new trend in UK for that uh, screening, but I think even in parts of USA, Europe, anyways, anywhere in the in the world, there is not too much agreement. Uh, I think if you can add uh, something like uh, in Jordan, but but from my point of view, currently we have to to, to at least focus on these be children with high risk factors and ab and abnormal findings on a clinical examination. I agree, totally agree that. We, you will miss some cases during examination. And there is children presenting with DDH frank dislocation with no one risk factor. There is no family history. No, 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 he is not a breach. He is no, no, no oligohydrominus. No risk factors and no family history and negative findings at file and presented to you at age of one year with limping. You find that there is a dislocation. But you cannot make a screening program for the whole country. You, you, you look for, sometimes this screening program is cost effectiveness. You can consider, you cannot forget the cost effectiveness and how it is will be difficult to assess the thousands every year with screening ultrasound. I think it is not easy job. Maybe later on in, in our country that we, we can adopt such a program. I don't, I don't know if Dr. Maybe uh, Dr. Matthew, if yeah. you can add something for this uh, program, how we can uh, apply it, or what, what is the usefulness of, the, of this screening program? Well, uh, in the United Kingdom, currently the screening is, all babies get a clinical examination of their hips as well as their eyes and their heart and everything else when they're born. And we only ultrasound selected babies based on the factors you said, a family history, or an abnormal clinical examination, or a foot uh, foot abnormalities, then those babies will have a hip ultrasound scan, and that's typically done around about the age of six weeks. Uh, some hospitals, uh, the scan will be done by one of the um, uh, radiology consultants, uh, and some hospitals, including Southampton, the scans are done by the pediatric orthopedic surgeons. So we have a, a, a weekly uh, hip screening clinic. Uh, I don't do it. My colleagues do it. And we will do the scans ourselves uh, because, as you say, it's a dynamic examination. And it's much better to actually look at the hips as you stress it. And you can measure the graph angles and look at the stability of the hip. Whereas if the scan is done by someone in x-ray, you, you're just looking at static images. Um, so although we maybe want to try and get to a universal hip ultrasound screening program, we're not there yet. And we're not going to be there for a few, some years, I don't think. Um, so I, it's, we work with what we've got, which is clinical examination and it's not perfect. Uh, all babies should have another examination in this country when they're about six weeks of age, run by the um, uh, general practice uh, uh, and uh, as like a, a sort of secondary examination and, and the hope that maybe if you've missed it at birth, you'll pick it up again at six weeks. But there's still babies presenting at one year of age, uh, walking with a limp, as you showed on that nice video. Uh -huh. Even in, in, in UK, is the same story in the U Jordan. It is everywhere, I think. 
there yeah, is yeah. always yeah. always some cases present without any 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 risk factor without anything Matasem, let me add a few points. I think screening is an important issue since the risk in, of DDH in the Middle East is very high. Uh, in, in Jordan, we start, uh, I think uh, Dr. Ahmed Marzouk is aware of that, uh, making a committee uh, to put a guidelines for screening of DDH. If, if you look to our clinic, you will find most of our uh, patients, more than 60% of our patients, and at the same the same percentage of our surgeries are on on kids with DDH, which means uh, the incidence is high, and uh, there is no screening program. So uh, so we see uh, uh, lots of cases uh, each clinic uh, doing a screening program. Hopefully, in the next few months in Jordan, uh, will. Uh, uh, make things better and we can manage these kids uh, earlier uh, without and we'll uh, decrease the uh, incidence and the percentage of surgeries uh, we, we do. Hopefully. Yes, thank you. And uh, now I can we can conclude, I think, uh, uh, this uh, lecture. And uh, Dr. Firas, you can say some words and maybe... Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Matosan, for your... Uh, uh, talk. I think uh, talking about DDH uh, need uh, um, many, many lectures, but you uh, uh, went over the topic uh, uh, smoothly and think the, the uh, points needed to be known by the residents, uh, uh, you highlight them uh, clearly. Uh, thank you all. Professor Matthew, thank you for, uh, being, uh, for, you for uh, being with us uh, for the last one hour. Uh, I, I know you, you have, your time is uh, busy, uh, but uh, we appreciate uh, that being with us. Uh, I think in the future with uh, uh, more activities, especially uh, in the Jordan Orthopedic Society, something concerning the pediatric will happy to, uh, to invite you and I'm sure you will accept our invitation in the future. Uh, thank you all. And thank you for the guys who are working on the educational program. Uh, Proceed and stay safe uh, with this uh, pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much Good for the sir. invitation. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Matthew. Thank you. You are most welcome. Thank you, Matizam. And thank you for all the, the for my colleagues. Thank you for everybody. And thank you. We can thank conclude that, sir. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks for all. Bye. Bye. Thank bye. you. Thank you all. Bye.